the federal government is projected to spend more than $43 trillion. If the Super Committee only cuts $1.2 trillion as required by the Budget Control Act, we reduce federal spending by only 2.7 percent. If the Super Committee would go big and agrees to cut $4 trillion over 10 years, we are still only cutting the federal budget by 9.1 percent. Mr. Speaker, we can do better, and we must do better. We cannot continue to spend our nation's future away. My children, my grandchildren, deserve so much better and so much more. I'm proud tonight to stand here with one of my colleagues, the gentleman from Oregon, to, to have a discussion tonight about this very issue. Republicans and Democrats alike, we believe that we must do more, be more, and be better for the next generation of Americans. And with that, I'd like to yield some time to, to my colleague from Oregon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here on the floor doing a colloquy with a Republican colleague of mine. That's not common these days. Perhaps in the not uh, too distant uh, past, it was more common. But uh, I think it shows that there's an opportunity for uh, actually good big picture agreements on what we need to do in, in general, although we may disagree in some of the particulars. I'd like to uh, point out uh, uh, some of the real problems that my colleague from Wisconsin uh, uh, alluded to. First and foremost, got a chart here that talks about the amount of money we're actually borrowing uh, to, to make our payments in this country. He's right. We're spending way too much. We're spending almost $3.6 trillion. Our revenue is only about $2.2 trillion. We're borrowing almost 40 percent of what we spend. You can't do that in your household, folks. You can't do that in your small business. And we shouldn't be doing that and can't do that as the greatest nation on earth and keep our fiscal balance sheets in play. Right now, our debt is up to almost $15 trillion, and our deficit has been stuck at $1.3 trillion for the last uh, three years. The projections are even worse. I'd like to show a chart that shows the long-term projections, uh, given the current rate of spending and our, our level of revenues, which are quite low at this point in time. Uh, it's a little bit busy, but there's a, a grayer portion down below you can see that talks about the, uh, the, the actual current law budget. That's the stuff that my friend in Wisconsin and I have to budget to that the Congressional Budget Office puts out. But the real budget is what the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget talks about. That's the real long-term debt that we're dealing with. That assumes, uh, unlike the current law budget, that we're not going to eliminate all the tax breaks to middle-class Americans, different corporations. It assumes that we're not going to have docs have to pony up a 30 percent cut in their wages to make ends meet. And it also assumes that we're going to do something to keep the alternative minimum tax from affecting middle-class Americans. I'd also like to point out that this is not a good picture. You look what's happened historically. We are in a really bad situation at this point in time. And there are some pretty big historical uh, drivers to this. I'd like to switch to a, a different chart. This chart shows historically where our revenues and our spending have been. The top line here is our spending. This blacker line down below is our revenues. They've been a little out of whack forever. You know, only during uh, the years when we had a Democrat president and Republican Congress were they back in, in, in good shape. That was uh, just 15 years ago. But you can see that we historically have had our revenues probably in the 18 to 18.5% uh, range and our uh, uh, expenditures in the 20% range. Not great, but we're worse now. We're at 25% in spending and only 14 or 15% in revenues to emphasize the point my colleague from Wisconsin made. So we've got to really work at getting this stuff back under control or we're not going to be where we need to be. Uh, I'd point out real quick that uh, uh, we are to that point, we're actually giving away almost a trillion dollars in tax breaks. And I think my colleague has some good points he's going to make in a, in a moment on that. And we've got to get this tax code under control. As a small businessman, you can't possibly do your own tax. You can't even come close. When I started my veterinary business, Way back when, I'm not going to say how old I was then, my friend, but uh, I could actually do my own taxes. That's impossible these days. That's impossible. It shouldn't be that Byzantine. Uh, let's look at the, uh, the other piece of the problem here is the entitlement system. People don't want to admit this, uh, particularly some people on my side of the aisle, but we're growing broke here in the Medicare system. The bottom blue is Social Security, Medicaid, and other health expenditures is the green, and Medicare is up top there. And here's our revenue line. We're busting through it with Medicare. 
That's not because of malfeasance. Yeah, there's some waste, fraud, and abuse that we got to get under control, and I'm sure we can get it under control. But there's some simple economics here. In 1960, there were five workers for every one beneficiary. Right now, there's only three workers for every beneficiary, and in 2035, there's only going to be two workers for every beneficiary. Less money in to take care of more folks. Yeah, more folks. Back in 1975, we had about 25 million beneficiaries, I believe. Now it's almost 89 million beneficiaries. And the cost per Medicare recipient has gone through the roof. Not because that's bad, we're living longer, hopefully living healthier lives. But right now we're spending about, uh, or in 1975, we spent about $2,000 per Medicare enrollee. Hard to believe in this day and age. Now it's 18,000. So more people, uh, more expensive care, which is good quality care, and frankly, less workers to help provide for the benefits adds up to this huge, huge growth in uh, spending that's going to be facing us over the next few years unless we get our act together at this point in time. And I'd like to turn it back over to my colleague from Wisconsin. He has some interesting ideas. Thank, thank you very much. You know, I, I appreciate the, the slides and the discussion. Our country is facing a demographics problem. Uh, right now, our birth rate is getting close to just replacement levels, and the circumstance that uh, my colleague just showed with Medicare and Social Security spending uh, outstripping our ability to pay uh, is in part because of this. We have a declining population and will have. I have a grandson who's eight years old today, and when he reaches age 65, nearly 47 percent of the U.S. population will be age 65 or older. And so this problem, if we don't address it soon, will simply get worse. And so the sooner that we get at it, the better. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, we need to take a look at all areas of spending, and we also need to take a look at revenue. Uh, my colleague just mentioned the, the need for tax reform, and, and I couldn't agree more. Our tax system is notoriously complex, forcing families and employers to spend over $6 billion hours and over $160 billion a year trying to negotiate our tax code. Comparatively, the U.S. spends 50 to $60 billion per year on pharmaceutical R&D, which has the potential to save lives. I'd like to show the American people what our tax code actually looks like. This is it right here. It's over 9,000 pages long of fine print, and no one can really understand it. And I, I want to compare it to something else, because I think this is salient. This is the United States Constitution. When our founders founded our country, they were able to print this on about 30 pages right here. And yet today, our tax code is almost 10,000 pages. And inside this document are a myriad ways that businesses and individuals can find loopholes, places to hide, and places to basically kind of dictate how they can apply their taxes. Now, taxes are applied to them. We need to simplify this tax code for sure. Um, and and I, would, I would challenge the, the committee as they look at ways to consider removing loopholes, removing um, uh, tax deductions, and simplifying this tax code so that we can have a, a tax code that is fairer, simpler, and easier for the American people. The idea that we're spending billions of hours to do tax returns. Uh, take, take, for example, my own small business. And uh, during my career, I had C corporations and S corporations, LLC corporations, but I chose to operate those corporations as pass-throughs. We would pass the profits of those corporations through to me as the shareholder and through to our employees, and we would pay those taxes at a personal level. And so it's easy to say, well, let's, let's just uh, change the tax code for businesses, but if we don't change the tax code for, for every American, to make it fair, simpler, and easier to comply with, we really don't get at the problem. I also want to talk a little bit about identifying the problem correctly, because I think sometimes uh, here in Washington, D.C., we might uh, co collect or connect the dots, but we don't often collect the right dots. Let me show you a slide that talks about consumer spending. I think the idea is if we, if we discuss consumer spending, most Americans would say that consumer spending goes down during recessions, and therefore we should come up with some type of tax reform, give a $200 tax credit, a 2% tax credit, so that we can, we can boost consumer spending to get our economy going again. But if we look at it historically, 
Each of the dark lines here represent recessions that our country has faced. And really, we did have in this last recession a very modest drop in consumer spending. But if we think or if we, if we feel that we've identified the problem in consumer spending, this chart shows that consumer spending, in effect, is not the problem. It, it is not the problem. Now, did it drop a little bit? Sure. It dropped back about a year and a half or two years' time. But it didn't drop much. And so if we just try to fix that, in fact, consumer spending today is up higher than it was during the recession. And so if we continually tell ourselves that consumer spending is a problem and we try to fix it, we're not really identifying what the real problem is. Uh, we need to remember what, what put us into this mess, and it was really a housing crisis. And in fact, housing has not come back at all. And, and anything that we look at as far as trying to fix our economy, spurring job growth, I believe we need to take a look at our tax code. We need to take a look at the regulatory environment. We need to take a look at energy policy. We need to take a look at home construction. And those types of things will help spur economic growth. The types of, those are the types of things that we need to focus on that will actually begin to change the dynamics of the U.S. economy again. And I'll turn it back to my colleague again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh yeah, I mean, we've got to get this economy going again. Uh, I'd like to uh, think that uh, really the bottom line, while everyone's looking for a magic wand from Washington, D.C., private enterprise is the real engine of economic growth. And I think my colleague has uh, talked about that and has another chart that would demonstrate that really, really well. The, uh, the point being here that uh, uh, it's going to take a, a huge lift and a huge push by this committee to go way beyond what anyone has ever considered in the past. I mean, I'd like to remind America, we already passed this Budget Control Act in August that set some targets for our domestic defense, uh, domestic and defense discretionary spending. But that's only a third of our budget. Two-thirds of our budget is in the mandatory payments. Some of the uh, uh, entitlement programs that I pointed at a minute ago, as well as ag payments, as well as other uh, income stream programs for special groups, We've got to get our mandatory payments under control to make sure that we get on a trajectory that's going to make a difference. I'd also point out that a lot of people say, oh, Kurt, you know, let's just cut defense or let's just get rid of the Department of Education. Well, you know, I'm not sure I agree with all of those ideas out there. Certainly, we could reduce in both of those departments. That's a good idea. But what I have to point out is our current deficit is $1.3 trillion. That's more than the combined budget of the defense and domestic discretionary programs. So you have to get at the long-term programs and the revenue issues that my colleague and I are talking about to actually put this country on a different trajectory. How do you get that business to start investing? How do you get private enterprise to be part of the engine of economic growth? Well, we may agree or disagree on the floor here in a lot of different ways. You've seen that in Congress this past year. But I would point out to my colleagues, at the end of the day, it was Republicans and Democrats that passed the CR the continuing resolution for 2011. It was Democrats and Republicans that voted to put the Budget Control Act in play, and it was Democrats and Republicans that voted to make sure the 2012 budget came out the way it was. So while I think the rest of the world, thanks to the media, looks at us as, as huge failures, and certainly we could do better, but at the end of the day, when the chips are down, maybe at the last minute, we seem to be delivering. And it's up to this super committee to do the same. Right now, they're charged with only coming up with another only, I say, relative terms. As a small businessman, I can't believe I'm saying this, Reed. But, you know, only $1.2 trillion or $1.5 trillion. That's a hunk of money. But to solve this problem, according to the credit agencies, you know, top economists in this country, uh, think tanks and working groups from Simpson Bowles to Rivlin Domenici, uh, Congressman Ryan's work, I mean, they've all indicated we have to do much more than that to change the trajectory of our country's financial future. And that's getting close to a $4 trillion change overall. We made a down payment in 917. The committee's charged for, for doing only one, two, or one, five, but that's not enough. They have to double up their charge to get to at least $4 trillion or more in savings and revenues to close that gap. Right now, I mean, uh, we can argue, we probably have different opinions about where we want to be as far as how much debt we should hold, what's the right amount of deficit on an annual basis. Uh, but uh, a lot of folks think if we get it down to 60 per, our debt down to 60 percent of GDP in the near term, go in more later on without harming the recovery is, a, is the main question there, and also get our deficits down to 3 percent of GDP on an annual basis, that we will be in a much better spot, a spot where we will not get our credit downgraded by Moody's or Standard & Poor's and all these guys. So we have a lot of work to do, I think, but, and this committee is going to have to really 
go way beyond the natural divisions. This is not a simple exercise. Everybody's cut is someone else's sacred program. You know, if I had a big defense base in my district, I would probably look at the Department of Defense a little bit differently. You know, but you know, I do think there's some opportunities in contracting, weapons procurement. I want to protect the men and women on the ground, just like my colleague from Wisconsin does. But this is not enough. We have to look at the bigger cost drivers, and that's in our revenue system that's terribly broken. I point out another idea uh, that's out there that I, I happen to subscribe to, it seems to get some horsepower in my town halls, is the Bull Simpson approach to tax reform. What they do is they talk about changing the tax rates and the tax breaks. They get rid of all the tax breaks. That's a scary thought. We'd have a lot of people lifetime employment trying to get those back, wouldn't we? Get rid of all those tax breaks and reduce everyone's tax rates. We give away so much in revenue that we can reduce the tax rates for every single income bracket and still put money on the table to pay down on our debt and maybe keep a couple of programs alive. Their proposal reduces, on average, uh, the low-income tax rates from about 15 to 8 percent, the middle class from about 22 down to about 15 or so percent, and the higher income and corporate income taxes down from about 36 to 39, down to about 20, 28, somewhere in that range. And if we went to a territorial tax system, along with the individual changes, as I agree with my colleague, you have to do individual and corporate together, or it doesn't work for the reasons he talked about with an S corporation. I'm a small businessman, too, and I got taxed on stuff that I was paying principal on, that I was investing in. You know, I didn't see it at, at my dinner table uh, or in my bank account, per, my personal bank account. So we've got to really fix the system. That's a great way to go. Uh, I guess I wouldn't advocate getting rid of all the tax breaks. You'd probably add some defined amount in, but not a trillion dollars. Maybe something that goes away after 10 years. We pick things that actually make America more competitive, put us on an economic trend where we need to grow and actually can grow business and get businesses to make that investment that they're holding off at this stage of the game. And I yield back. But let's talk a little bit about that investment. I think the idea here is we often think that the investment has to come from Washington, D.C. But the key to reducing unemployment is restoring private investment, as this chart shows. Every single time that uh, private investment goes down, unemployment rises. Private investment goes down, unemployment rises. And, and there is a, a key linchpin to our economy, and it's related to private investment. Companies like mine and like, like, like my colleagues from Oregon, his company, if, if we don't modify the tax code, if we don't fix a regulatory environment where there's un, so much uncertainty, if we don't address these things, then businesses are afraid and fearful to invest. And right now, that's exactly what we're seeing in the, in the U.S. economy. There's more money sitting on the sidelines than ever. We hear from it, about it every single day. And, and that fear factor is keeping our economy from moving forward. And without private investment, it's difficult to drive unemployment levels lower. And we need to drive unemployment levels lower as quickly and, and uh, as, as in fast an order as we possibly can to put Americans back to work. I agree also with your comments about the spending habits, how we have to address the key drivers of our debt, which include both the, the mandatory spending and entitlements like Medicare and Social Security, as well as the large uh, discretionary spending in defense. It isn't an either or, it must be a both and. And unfortunately, we somehow, for some reason, it's difficult for us to get there because every single member represents a different district. Their makeup of their districts are different. I come from a district that's very agricultural. And so farm subsidies and discussions about agriculture, whether it's uh, meat production, whether it's dairy and cheese production, whether it's corn production, play into our nation's deficit and debt. And, and we know that the pie has to get smaller. And at some point, we have to be honest with the American people, Mr. Speaker, that, that we must begin to reduce the size. And that means federal largesse has to go down, and we must encourage private investment to spur economic growth and get this country moving again. But there are things that are also obstructing it, and that is the idea that sometimes we end up demonizing really great ideas, really good ideas, or even we demonize ideas that aren't so good. And I'll tell you, the way we speak to one another, not just in this chamber, but in the media, how we talk to each other in our uh, campaign commercials and what have you, I think destroys confidence. I think it hurts the system. I think it damages debate. I think it, it, it uh, keeps good men and women from possibly running for an office like the one that I hold here. 
And, and we have to somehow, some way, find a way to begin to speak to each other like adults. The things that we teach our children when they go to, to kindergarten, we could learn here. We have to learn to be able to listen with open ears and see each other in a different light and begin to actually have solid debate about ideas without criticizing the person, without demonizing the individual, and without demonizing the idea. Let's instead open our debate, open our ears, open our eyes, and find solutions so that our children and grandchildren can have a brighter and more prosperous tomorrow. It's part of the reason that uh, my friend and colleague from Oregon today and I came to the chamber tonight, that we could have this conversation and demonstrate to the American people that it is possible to treat each other with respect, even when we have some disagreement. And I think we're, we're trying to demonstrate that tonight. Will the gentleman yield for a minute? Yes. Well, I, I agree. I totally agree with the gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, uh, far too often, uh, maybe I haven't done my duty and come down to the floor and spoken up uh, with, with friends and colleagues across the aisle like we're doing here tonight. And it gives the American people that watch C-SPAN or CNN or you name the show uh, the idea that everyone's out here uh, just for political gain and scoring their points. I don't know. I think Wisconsin and Oregon folks can smell uh, what's, what's really an honest discussion and what's just the talking points off the uh, the latest poll that you or I did uh, last week. Um, I think it's, I think we got to get past that. That's, when I go back home, uh, people are more concerned about just get along. They're, they get, they're past the point almost, except for the extremes, in uh, criticizing me or the work here. They just want us to start to get along and do what uh, uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin has talked about, and that's work together. Recognize that you're not going to get all your way. I'm not going to get all my way. Your ideas are as valid as mine, and my, me talking to you for another 20 days on the floor isn't going to convince you that your ideas are all worthless. And I've got to get over that. I've got to recognize the fact that it's a big country. What's good in Wisconsin may not be perfect for Oregon or Texas or Miami or San Francisco or New York, but it, it, it has a valid point. I think at this point in time, it's, uh, it's put up or shut up time. This country's in a world of hurt, not like I've ever seen in my lifetime. I hope never to see this again in my lifetime. I've got two young boys at home uh, uh, that are, uh, one, one's out of a job, the other's trying to get a job, just got out of college. And uh, I'm lucky that a couple of my other kids actually have jobs right now. I thank the lucky stars. But it's a tough, tough environment out there. We don't want to end up like Greece. I guess that's the poster child for America to look at in a negative way. I mean, Greece, uh, you know, Greece right now, their debt's 150% of GDP. 150 percent, folks. You know, that country is imploding as we speak. The e European Union is trying to help them, help bail them out. Well, what's going on? Well, actually, right now, Greece is scaling back its pensions dramatically, increasing property taxes significantly, and cutting income tax exemptions by 40 percent. Oh, yeah, Kurt, Kurt, that should have happened a while ago. Well, yeah, well, here's what they did a while ago. They already increased tax rates, raised excise taxes, and already had a reduction of 15 percent in public wages. This is going to be our country's future if we don't take the little steps now. They seem harsh, they seem tough, but as my colleague spoke very, very eloquently about, we've got to do some little things now. Everyone's ox, frankly, has to get gored a little bit, to be fair, but not so much that you end up Throwing people out on the streets. We can make our Medicare and Social Security programs stronger. We can have a tax code that's more friendly to small business and makes us more competitive internationally going forward. We just have to have the courage to step up and do that. I, for one, am going to stand with my colleague for Wisconsin behind this uh, super committee if they go big. If they just kick the can down the road by doing the $1.2 trillion minimal, what I need to do to get out of Dodge thing, I'm going to be critical. But if they actually are big and broad thinking, realize their kids and their kids, grandkids have a, have a stake in this, and that the future of our country, we will end up a second-tier country. And that's not a dramatic statement. It is a fact. If we do not come up with a $4 trillion comprehensive approach overall, including the $900 we already put down, $900 billion already put down, we will be downgraded, I think, by every single major rating agency significantly. China's currency will look a lot more attractive, potentially, than the U.S. dollar. 
If it, doesn't lo if it looks like America is headed the way of the European Union, Businessmen and women are not going to be wanting to invest in America. They're going to invest anywhere else, India, China, Brazil, maybe even Russia. That's not a prospect that I want for my kids' future or my country's future. We have a lot at stake at this point in time. Failure is not an option. Failure is clearly not an option. I think we need to put aside partisanship, look at the big picture, not poke each other in the eye. Look at the Senate the other day, right? Remember that? Here, here, here the Senate, we're coming back from uh, our work period, and the Senate has two interesting votes. Uh, on the surface, you know, both pieces had merit. One was, uh, let's do, in my opinion anyway, let's do a deal where we help school kids, uh, get, have teachers, make sure we have first responders. But the way they pay for that is they poke the other party in the eye by saying, well, we're going to have this millionaire's tax. That is p political rhetoric, folks. The next vote, is a 3% withholding vote, which is part of the president's program to, you know, frankly get the onus of this, this potential tax off of businesses and contractors so they can get back to working without having to pay the government money they don't have right now. But that's paid for with a 20% cut in domestic discretionary spending, poking the Democrats in the eye. That's not what this country should be about. That's an example of how to do it wrong, scoring political points. I'd like to think this next election, and frankly, this, the, the future of this country relies on people like my friend over here from Wisconsin that's willing to put that partisanship aside, look at the big picture, do what's right for the country, take the hits. I'm getting hit back home on my discussions, the stuff we're talking about, but I'm explaining it to folks, and maybe I'm lucky, come from Oregon, folks are actually willing to listen a little bit. But I think most Americans are willing to listen if you have smart people like my colleague from Wisconsin willing to lay it out for you where it just makes sense. And I yield back to my colleague. We have just a few minutes left. And I want you to know that uh, my colleague, Mr. Schrader, and I, uh, together with Representative Rooney, sent a letter to the Super Committee, and I'd like to just read it to the American people. We write to you as a bipartisan group of representatives from across the political spectrum in the belief that the success of your committee is vital to our country's future. We know that many in Washington and around the country do not believe we in Congress and those within your committee can successfully meet this challenge. We believe that we can and we must. To succeed all options for mandatory and discretionary spending and revenues must be on the table. In addition, we know from other bipartisan frameworks that a target of some $4 trillion in deficit reduction is necessary to stabilize our debt as a share of the economy, and to assure America's fiscal well-being. Our country needs our honest bipartisan judgment and our political courage. Your committee has been given a unique opportunity and authority to act. We are prepared to support you in this effort. My colleague and I have, have backed and encouraged the Super Committee to go big, to look at $4 trillion of deficit reduction, 9.1%. We know we can do that. It is not, it does not necessarily have to be draconian. And, and I know that we can get there. Uh, and for the last minute or so, my colleague from uh, Oregon, any last comments? I just want to say it's a pleasure to be on the floor of the House of Representatives, the United States Congress, with a, a friend and a colleague that's willing to put country first. And I think this is hopefully the beginning of a, a good relationship uh, in this body uh, and brings our country out of its worst fiscal crisis uh, since the Great Depression. And I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I move that the House do now adjourn. Does the gentleman yield back?